She went to Egypt and got him a wife. Now, if we follow the reasoning of the Muslims that connect Muhammad to Ishmael, uh, according to their sources, Ishmael himself and his mother settled in Mecca. Once in Mecca, Ishmael married a woman from the tribe of Jurhim. And by the way, this is not found in the Quran. The Quran says nothing about this. This is found in the Hadith literature, specifically Sahil Bukhari. And we know that Bukhari is written centuries after the death of Muhammad, over 200 years after his death. Be that as it may, Muslims deem Bukhari to be authentic without dispute. According to Bukhari, Ishmael married a woman from Jurhim. And then Abraham came to visit Ishmael and didn't find Ishmael at home and didn't like uh, this, this wife of Ishmael. So he made a comment and then she reported to Ishmael the comment that Abraham made. Ishmael realized that Abraham told Ishmael to get rid of his wife. So Ishmael divorced her. This is according to the Hadith literature. Sahil Bukhari, you'll find it there. So then Ishmael found another woman from the tribe of Jurhim and married her. And then again, according to the same tradition, Abraham again visited Ishmael. Again, Ishmael wasn't home. You would think that Abraham would stick around and wait for Ishmael to return. He didn't. He liked the second wife and pretty much told Ishmael to keep her. So as far as the Muslim sources are concerned, uh, Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael by virtue of the fact that Ishmael settled in Mecca, married a woman from the tribe of Jurhim, and they became the ancestors of the Quraysh tribe from whom Muhammad sprung. So this is according to the Islamic tradition. If we go by the biblical tradition, we must accept, uh, I'm sorry, reject, let me correct myself, reject the Islamic tradition because it conflicts with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament says Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran, not in Mecca. The Old Testament says that Ishmael's wife was an Egyptian, not from the tribe of Jurhim. Now again, someone will say, but see, your Bible's corrupt. The Muslim will say this. And we don't go by the Bible. We only accept those parts of the Bible that agree with the Quran and the authentic traditions attributed to Muhammad. However, you have a problem, Muslims, and here's the problem. If you recall, last night we had a discussion on the Quranic view of the Bible. We only gave some of the men, uh, pl uh, plenty of verses, some of the many verses from the Quran, which sh uh, shows that the author of the Quran and Muhammad believed that our Old, New Old Testament and New Testament were the revealed words of God. In fact, according to the Quran, Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession, as did Muhammad. If you want references from the Quran, you can go to Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3. Verses 48 to 50. Surah Imran, chapter 3, verses 48 to 50, uh, specifically verse 50. Again, chapter 5, verse 46, Surah Al Maida, chapter 5, verse 46. I want you to note these down and go back and read the Arabic, not just the English, to confirm what I'm about to say. And another reference, chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. Chapter 61, verse 6. In all of these passages, it says that Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. Confirm the Torah in his possession, the Torah that he had access to. Historically, we know what the Torah was in the possession of Christ, the Torah that Jesus was reading. Due to discoveries and manuscripts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Old Testament that Jesus would have been reading and confirming to be the words of God is the very Old Testament that we read today. That's the Old Testament that says Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran and married an Egyptian. So if the Quran is right, that Jesus confirmed the Torah, then that means the Old Testament that we currently read is the revealed words of God because that's the Torah that Jesus confirmed. If that's the case, then the Hadiths are wrong, which say that Ishmael settled in Mecca and married a woman of the tribe of Jurhim. So I want you to understand the implication of that. If the Quran is right, Jesus confirmed the Torah, and the Torah he confirmed is virtually identical to what we read today. That Torah bears witness against the Hadith and its assertion that Ishmael went to Mecca and married a woman from the tribe of Jurhim. Because the Torah says he settled in the wilderness of Paran, that's not Mecca, and married an Egyptian. So you have absolutely no evidence that Ishmael and Abraham went to Mecca and built the Kaaba. There is no evidence from the Bible. The evidence from the Bible refutes this assertion. There is no pre-Islamic archaeological or historical documentation that says that Abraham and Ishmael settled there. You only have the testimony of one man, and this testimony comes from a source written over 200 years after his death. And you want us to reject the testimony of the Bible and believe the testimony of such sources. And so uh, what, what Sam has uh, given us is another Islamic dilemma. Yesterday, Sam gave us an Islamic dilemma. 
In our next program, we're going to see a, an Islamic dilemma. And he's given us one now where either way you go, there's only two ways to go. And either way you go, you're in trouble. So the Bible says that, uh, that uh, uh, the Bible tells us where Ishmael went. And it's very different from the Muslim picture. Uh, according to this, Abraham and Ishmael had nothing to do with the Kaaba in Mecca or with any of these, uh, with any of these places. So what we have is uh, if, if the Bible's right, if the Bible's right, then these are all pagan practices. None of them go back to Abraham. None of them go back to Ishmael. They're purely pagan practices. So if the Bible's right, as the Quran says it is, and don't forget Muhammad himself put his hand on a copy of the Torah and swore that it's the word of God. So if Muhammad's right that the Bible's the word of God, and if the Quran is right that the Bible's the word of God, then Islam is a collection of pagan practices because that's what the Bible says. On the other hand, if the Bible's been corrupted in what it says about Abraham and Ishmael and, 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 and what they did, if these are wrong, then the Bible isn't the word of God, in which case the Quran and Muhammad are wrong, and Islam is a false religion. So, notice, if the Bible's right, then Islam's a false religion because it's just a collection of pagan practices. Uh, but if the Bible's wrong, then Islam, once again, is false because uh, Muhammad and the Quran were wrong when it says the Bible's the word of God. Either way, Islam is false. Uh, how can you Muslims deal with this? We gave you a, a, uh, we gave you an argument like this yesterday. We gave you another argument today. We'll give you another argument uh, later on this evening. Over and over again, we see Muslims have only one of two directions they could go, and either one means that Islam is false. Thank you. Uh, let's take a break, and we'll be back. Uh, stay with us. Uh, welcome back again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we are uh, uh, the new edition of Jesus or Muhammad, and our title tonight, our topic, Pagan, the Pagan Origins of Islam, and uh, we talked uh, more than half an hour explaining our topic tonight, and uh, we are ready to receive your calls, 248-416-1300, and I think we have a call, George. Good evening, George. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good evening. Yes. Uh, God bless everybody. Thank you. Uh, what a coincidence, you know, you're talking about this subject, and uh, I'm reading a book by the name of the Sword of the Prophet of Islam by Serge Trifkovic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, they, he said <laughs> that Ishmael never went to Mecca. Exactly. Ishmael went only to Egypt. And he got married, and he got two sons. Uh, I don't know about two sons. He had 12 sons, but go ahead. I think uh, probably he got married the first time, and he got two sons. One of them, one of these two sons, anyway, it's not for sure, because this guy here, uh, he, t he went to the Middle East, and he tried to get as much information as he can. But one of these sons, he went to Mecca. Uh, the book I'm reading right now says that I was looking at that 490 after Jesus uh, there is a prince became the prince of Mecca his name Kusai Ibn Kalb and this guy here he became the prince of Mecca and he was uh, the chief tribe of Quraysh, and uh, it was Mecca, it was uh, the Kaaba over there, and he was as ritual every year before uh, they go to Al-Hajj, what they call, he was washing the Kaaba. And some sources, they said that the black stone, uh, probably some of the Arab tribes, they went to Damascus for trade, they brought that uh, black stone 
from an area which is south of Damascus. And if you go by yourself over there, you're not going to find nothing but black, black rocks. So 490 after Jesus, it was Kaaba. It was a tradition of Hajj over there. It was a Ramadan fasting. They used to fast for a whole month, you know, before Islam came. And as we know, Muhammad born 570, and he died 632. So 490 to, uh, to 570, it's about 70 years before Muhammad. Uh, there was fasting Ramadan, and there was doing the uh, paganism uh, tradition. So uh, I would like you to emphasize on this subject that whatever tradition the Islam have, it's not from Islam uh, themselves. It's a tradition it was in the Arabia before Islam came. And thank you. Thank you. You want to comment on that or take the you next call? Come, okay, let me, I wanted to read some reference on the black mm -hmm. stone he just said. I had said earlier that these are pagan practices, and let me just elaborate. Uh, and these, uh, these are things that even Muslims will admit, but what they will say is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, and that the descendants of Ishmael then perverted these practices by worshiping other gods. In other words, they'll tell you, yes, the pagans before Muhammad ran around the Kaaba seven times. They would run between the hills of Safa and Marwa, uh, seven times. In fact, according to one tradition, Muhammad's companions hesitated to run between these two hills because initially they used to be two idols, and they would run between the two hills in honor of these idols. Uh, but Muhammad said, no, that's okay, you can keep that practice. And the justification is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, as well as Abraham, that later on, throughout history, the descendants of Ishmael perverted. Uh, so they'll tell you, yeah, these practices, the pagans performed them. However, they were originally instituted by monotheists to worship the one true God, and these practices were uh, performed in honor of the one true God of Abraham. Like we said, and we're going to emphasize, in fact, we're going to sound like broken records, there is absolutely no biblical, historical, or archaeological proof. Specifically, there is no pre-Islamic proof that a Muslim can point to to show that Abraham Ishmael ever went to Mecca. Uh, but I just want to comment on... on uh, the things that Muhammad did, which prove that the God that sent him is not the same God that raised up Abraham and sent Moses with the law. This again comes uh, from an Islamic source. This comes from the History of Al-Tabari. Uh, History of Al-Tabari, which you can actually find in English. This comes from Volume 6. And he, he, he mentions an event that while Muhammad was in Mecca, after he claimed to be, to be a prophet of God, after he claimed that Gabriel came and commissioned him, he was running around the Kaaba and kissed the black stone. And I want to read that reference because this kissing of the black stone is sheer idolatry. It is proof that Muhammad was not worshiping the God of Abraham and that the God of Moses did not send Muhammad, had nothing to do with him. But let me read the reference. And I know I think we have other callers, but I think it's important I read this. This comes from the History of Al-Tabari, uh, Volume 6, and uh, pages 98 and following. Uh, actually, it's pages 101 to 102. I apologize. Let me read this. Uh, Ibn Humayd, Salama, Muhammad bin Ishaq, Yahya bin Urwa, bin Al-Zubair, his father, Ur Urwa, and then Abdullah ibn Amr bin Al-As, I said to him, what was the worst attack you saw by Quraysh upon the Messenger of God when they openly showed their enmity to him? And this is from pages 101 all the way 102. I just want to get my references straight. And if I'm mistaken, I do apologize. Our intention is not to give you uh, misinformation. He replied, I was with them when their uh, nobles assembled one day in the Hijr and discussed the messenger of God. They said, we have never seen the like of what we have uh, endured from this man. Now, these are the pagans complaining about the abuse of Muhammad. Muhammad constantly abusing them. We've never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers. This is Muhammad, by the way. And what's interesting, Dave, is yesterday we got calls from Muslims saying, you shouldn't be criticizing other religions. You shouldn't be attacking other religions. Just, you know, practice your religion, talk about your own. Here we have an Islamic reference saying that Muhammad constantly attacked, derided, insulted other people's beliefs and values. Look at the reference again. He has derided our traditional values abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. 
We have endured a great deal from him, or words to that effect. While they were saying this, now note this, this part. The messenger of Allah suddenly appeared and walked up and kissed the black stone. Then he 